thing. Thank you again, Colin. I'll let you introduce uh, yourself and thank you very much for agreeing to do this. I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. So it's all yours. My pleasure. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's really awesome to see so many people here. You know, you put up a talk about dead languages and you expect, you know, two or three people, but lo and behold, uh, the dead languages may very well live again. Um, my name is Colin Gorey. Uh, if for those of you who don't know me, I see some familiar faces, but I also see some some new uh, faces and some new names. So I am a linguist and I am basically my big thing is to try and bring information about linguistics out. And I, as I always say, out of the ivory tower. Um, it's kind of my my tagline, like Mahmoud has uh, the the bridge dweller thing, um, and and one of my big passions is specifically and bringing philosophy back to the marketplace. Right, right, okay, yeah, that 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 one that one has legs. I like that one. Um, and so one of my big passions in that realm is about historical languages, um, or <laughs> in the parlance of our times, dead languages, and. I am so excited about dead languages that I've been spending my most of my days uh, in the past few years teaching them. And the two that I teach are Latin and Old English. And But I'm obsessed with learning them. I find them for paradoxically almost easier to learn than living languages, because maybe because fewer people can correct your pronunciation. I don't know. Um, but today I'm going to try and share some of that uh, that enthusiasm four dead languages with you and tell you, first of all, why you might want to learn them. Um, second of all, how can we really know that much about what they sounded like, what they were like? I'm going to introduce you to a few of my uh, a few of my favorites and and one that I'm working on myself, uh, learning that is. And then I am going to talk nuts and bolts about how you might actually go about learning a dead language because it's not the most straightforward thing in the world. Um, and there's been a lot that I've had to figure out sort of by trial and error over the years. So that's the plan. Um, so first off, why would you want to learn dead languages? There is a kind of conventional answer, which is, you know, oh, you get a, a view into another time and place. You get to experience life through the eyes of other people that are very much unlike you, which is all true. But you've probably heard it before. Um, so I'm going to try and give you a few unconventional reasons. Um, one is learn them for the things that get lost in translation. There is so much, you know, a lot of people are very interested in reading the classics um, and there's a whole tradition of, of great books education. And far be it from me to, to disparage that impulse, but there's only so much that you can get through the translation. There's inevitably something lost. And this is probably not news to anyone, but today I'm going to try and show you specifically the kinds of things that get lost. So many of the the great books that people learn are are verse, are, are poetry, and translating poetry is always a a very difficult proposition because about half of of what's there is form, and the form must necessarily change. So what do I mean by form? Things like rhyme scheme, um, things like the meter. What does the poetry actually sound like? What what words sound like other words in this language? It's going to be completely different from language to language. And so you're never going to get what it was like in ancient Greek from a translation. Now, there are great translators out there who can give you other things uh, and who, who can try and show you something of of what you're missing, but you're always going to be missing something. And I'm going to tell you that you can actually get some of those things if you put in a bit of legwork. Okay, it's actually a lot of legwork, but um, but they're they're worth it's worth doing if you're interested in these texts. Um, and another reason is that the farther back you go, uh, especially with respect to languages that are related to each other, you know, take for example English and um, Hindi, distantly related to one another, although it may not seem that way. But the farther back in their histories you go, the more like each other they become, because they came from one single point, and therefore the farther back you go, you're going to be sort of approaching each other. And so you get to understand 
the deep connections between a lot of things, um, the farther back you go. So when you look at classical languages, when you look at old English, for example, you see a version of English that's much more like German than, um, than modern English is. And you get to understand a lot of these deep connections that exist between languages and also between different areas of eras of history. And um, you get an amazing, uh, amazing store of trivia. So if you're ever worried about being bored at a cocktail party, simply look around the room. Ah, did you know the word for thimble comes from blah, 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 blah. And there you go. Um, I'm not sure if that's a winning strategy, but that's the one I've used. And uh, I sometimes get invited back. So, you know, um, could be worse. So that's, you know, hopefully um, getting you a little bit excited about why you might want to learn dead languages. You may have a particular text in mind. You may have a a language that you want to explore. Um, I'm going to try and keep my eye on the on the chat. I just see I just see heckling from from Mahmoud so far. But if you have a particular language that you're interested in, go ahead and write it in the chat or a particular text, um, and and maybe we can see what sorts of things people are interested in learning. Um, for me, I was always interested in um, ever since I was in middle school, and people told me that there was an old English. I was like, I got to learn that then. Um, and Old English is the language that gave us the great poem Beowulf, um, which is, which we'll see an excerpt from a little bit later. Um, but it's a, if you love Tolkien, Beowulf is essentially the source text. Um, not only, not the only one, but it's, uh, you'll be reading along and you'll be saying, oh, 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 cause that's where he got that from. Oh, that's where he got that from. Um, it's, it's. Uh, it's it's a fantastic poem uh, on its own artistic merits, but also um, because of the links that it shows that it shows us to contemporary fantasy and as well to um, to the history of the the heroic age um, in among the Germanic peoples. You know, if you're interested in things like Vikings, you'll see many many connections um, in Beowulf, which is from an earlier period, but it. Uh, it's it's pointing to a lot of the the same ethos. Um, so if you're interested in in heroic literature, it's it's a great poem for that. And so that that was the the language that got me really excited. And I got a, myself a a book of called a guide to Old English. And I opened it up and I thought, huh, okay, first step, learn 700 charts. And then young Colin put that book down and didn't pick it up for many many years uh, until I started to understand how better um, or how best to learn dead languages. And so I'm going to try and uncover some of that uh, as we go through. Um, but first of all, are we, how are we able to know as, as much as we do about dead languages? We obviously, we can treat them as just sort of written things. We can pronounce them in whatever way comes to our mind and not be too worried about what, um, how the people at the time spoke these languages. But I think in doing that, we're missing out on something crucial, which is that in acquiring languages, our minds are predisposed to use sound. And having a language that you only read or that you only read through the lens of, of, of how you pronounce your first language, you know, you can, you can take a, a Latin sentence, you know, quid pro quo, and you can say it with an R, like an English R, and that's fine. Um, but if you can start to approximate our best guess of what the Romans sounded like, you're sort of creating a new representation for that language separate from English in your mind, and that's going to help you learn it. Um, so that raises the question, how on earth do we know anything about what these people who had no tape recorders whatsoever how do we know what they sounded like at all? And we have lots of different sources of evidence that we can use. Um, we can use evidence from written documents. Occasionally people commented on how they spoke. Um, pretty rarely, pretty rarely, but occasionally people did comment uh, and wrote direct descriptions of, of how they spoke. You can compare related languages. You can look at, um, you can look at how words got loaned from one word from one language into another. So for example, um, in German, we have um, the word 
Caesa, which is a loan word from the Latin word that gives us Caesar. Um, we're used to pronouncing that with a S sound at the start, but the fact that we have a K sound in German gives us, gives us pause and makes us think maybe there was perhaps a reason why the Romans spelled it with a C, which is a, a letter they use for other K sounds. Uh, and indeed, we can triangulate the evidence and say, okay, yeah, actually the Romans did use K for the sound at the start of Caesar. And it's, uh, it's us who have changed, or specifically um, uh, French in that case. We can use forms from descendant languages. So this is, a, this is something called the comparative method. We look for, um, say you wanted to learn something about how English used to sound. How are you going to do that? Well, one thing you could do is go through all of these different English dialects and see how they say different things. And that can be evidence. Say there's a pronunciation in one tiny little village off off in the countryside somewhere, but they say things differently. And they say things in a way that reminds you a lot of how it is in this other related language, say German. So say um, you have a language, say you have a variety of English that says a word like daughter with a ch, like doctor. Interesting. Does that remind you of anything? Well, if you know German, then you know that there's a ch sound in that same, in the equivalent word. And then you start to think, well, two points two kinds of evidence are pointing to the same thing. It looks like there may have been something there, some sound that we no longer pronounce. And the fact that we spell it D-A-U-G-H-T-E-R, what was that G-H? Did people just write it there because they enjoyed having the extra, the extra letters to write? Likely not. So we get evidence from, from the writing, we get evidence from related languages, we get evidence from, um, from the dialect forms of the descendant languages, and we triangulate and come up with a reconstruction. And you put enough nerds in a room for decades and centuries, and eventually they get pretty good at what these, uh, what these languages probably sounded like. So for really well-studied languages like Latin, like Old English, um, like Ancient Greek, you, uh, <laughs> Mahmoud's imagining this, uh, this setup of, uh, you know, a thousand nerds with typewriters all saying, we must figure out exactly how Julius Caesar spoke. Um, it's just maybe not your scene. Uh, but we actually do get at a, a fairly good uh, approximation, or at least a few fairly good approximations of how people spoke in these historical periods. Mm -hmm. And then this becomes really useful because you can then adopt this reconstructed pronunciation for yourself and sort of trick your mind into thinking, I'm in ancient Rome. I'm in Anglo-Saxon England. I'm in, you know, Tang Dynasty China. And you can hijack that part of your mind that, that's used to listening to different sound systems and constructing these representations of what the language is like. You can use um, that part of your mind to your benefit. Um, so, dead languages. Why you might want to learn them and why we actually think that there's something there's something solid out there for you to learn. Uh, so let me introduce you to a few of my favorites. I'll try not to uh, bloviate excessively, a word I heard uh, yesterday for the first time in a long time, and I thought I have to incorporate that. Um, so let me, I will share my screen. This is the traditional Zoom ritual of finding all the buttons. There we go. How does that look? Decent? Excellent, okay. So the languages that I'm going to be talking about today, two of them are languages I teach. That will be Latin and Old English. And the third one is a language I am interested in learning and I'm by no means an expert on, uh, which is classical Chinese. And these are well, two related languages and one unrelated language. And you'll get a, a sense of the kinds of stuff that you're missing out on by not, uh, by not speaking these languages. All right, so one thing that we can say about Latin is that Latin poetry makes very good use of one feature of the language. 
And this feature is the fact that the word order is extremely free. So here's a line, a bit morbid, but mor set fugacem persequitur virum. Death pursues even the fleeing man. But let's look at this word by word. Mors, death. Ah, I can write. Mo death et even. Fugacem, fleeing. Persequitur. Let me get persecute from this, right? So pursue and man. So notice that fugacem et vir and virum are separated here by persequitur. This is something that Latin absolutely loves to do, which is it allows you to juxtapose things that, um, that in English we wouldn't be able to. It's very hard for us to say death even fleeing pursues the man because that makes us think that death's the thing that's fleeing and death is definitely not fleeing in this instance. Um, but here we have fugacem et and persequitur joined up together. So we have this contrast, fleeing and pursuing that come right up against each other. Whereas in English, we have to have them quite separate and that, that effect is unavailable to us. Another thing about Latin that we can see from this passage is its conciseness. So in English, we have these articles that we um, require uh, around nouns at various times. Um, if you say death pursues even fleeing man, you kind of sound like, um, I'm trying to think of that uh, that old show, um, Rocky and Bullwinkle, when they would have the the Soviet spies and they would they would say like things like death pursues even fleeing man, they would leave off the articles. Um, uh, incidentally, Russian is another language that doesn't have articles. Um, so Latin doesn't either. And it allows us to say this whole thing with five words instead of, in this case, six. Um, but this is a small example. The conciseness of Latin goes far beyond just uh, condensing six words down to five. All right, let me, let me go on. Latin also has a, a meter, a poetic meter. Um, so if you're not used to thinking about poetry in terms of meter, think of English, which loves in traditional poetry, iambic pentameter. And if you went to school in certain places, you probably had this phrase drilled into you. But if you haven't, um, I'll just give you a brief outline. An I iambic pentameter is a line of poetry that goes like this. Da, 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 da. Iambic because it's composed of these things called iams, which go stressed, unstressed, or sorry, unstressed, stressed, iam, da da, da da, da da, da da, da da, and there are five of them. So pentameter. Um, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Classic example, Shakespeare. Iambic pentameter. Latin used a variety of different meters, um, and this one hexameter specifically dactylic hexameter, it took from Greek. And for the Romans, the meter of a poem was very intimately tied in with its genre. So hexameter has this association of epic uh, for the Romans. So if you are writing in hexameter, you are writing serious stuff. And hexameter, as you might be able to guess, um, hex six, so it has six feet. Um, so iambic pentameter, each iamb is one foot. So five of those, that's the line. In hexameter, we need six. What kind of hexameter is it? It is dactylic. Dactylic hexameter. What does dactylic hexameter sound like? I'll give you an example uh, from Longfellow in English, and then you can sort of see what it's like in, we can move on to what it's like in Latin. But first, I'm going to take a swig of water. All right. This is the forest primeval, 
the murmuring pines and the hemlocks, bearded with moss and in garments green, indistinct in the twilight, stand like druids of eld with voices sad and prophetic, stand like harper's whore with beards that rest on their bosoms, loud from its rocky caverns, the deep-voiced neighboring ocean, speaks and in accents disconsolate answers the wail of the forest. So if a certain rhythm has started to creep over you, it's probably this one. So we have in English stressed, unstressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, unstressed. This is called a dactyl. Why is it called a dactyl? From the Greek word for finger. So if you think of the stressed as being long and the unstressed as being short, it's like the joints on a finger, right? The long and then too short. Um, so dactylic hexameter. This is the, so this is the forest primeval, the murmuring pines and the hemlocks. Um, this is how we scan. This is the, the technical term for uh, assigning, for sort of matching up the meter with the line. Uh, this is the forest primeval, the murmuring pines and the hemlocks. Uh, so this is hexameter in English. Not a very common meter in English. Um, Longfellow uses it here. But in very few other places is it used. This is... This is... I'm going to clear these. This is the uh, meter that you will read if you read the Aeneid in Latin. Um, so it has an Aeneid, for those who don't know, is Virgil's great epic, Vir Virgil's answer to the Odyssey. Um, try, he tried to write a, a national epic for Rome, and it ends up being like basically Greek mythology fanfic. Um, it's fantastic. And this is the meter that he uses or used. Then we have a different meter. So meter, as I've said, is very, uh, very closely associated with genre uh, for the Romans. And here we have a different kind, the elegiac couplet. So the elegiac couplet works a little bit differently. It's a couplet, so it's composed of groups of two lines, one after the other. Um, the first line is a hexameter that we're used to. And the second line is a pentameter. So See if you can tell the difference between these two lines here. In the hexameter rises the fountain silvery column. In the pentameter I, falling in melody back. So here's the first line is what we're used to. Dun da da dun da 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 dun da 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 da. In the second line we have da 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 da. So there's a kind of patness or neatness to the, the way it concludes. And this rounds out the couplet. And so these elegiac couplets are written with hexameters setting up, pentameters finishing off, like setup and punchline in, um, in comedy. It has that same kind of structure. And um, then when you write elegiac verse, you just chain these, these couplets together. And it's you might be able to tell from the name elegiac, these are supposed to be um, mournful affairs, but they end up being used for the sort of mournful love poetry, lovers' complaints, these kinds of things. Um, so let's take a look now at some actual Latin. So Ovid, this is um, from the first poem of Amores, which means loves. And let's see. All right, so this is elegiac poetry, and it's very self-conscious elegiac poetry. Um, so I will read it, and you will be able to see what it sounds like in Latin. Arma gravi numero violenta que bella parabam, edere materia conveniente modis. Pare erat inferior versus risisse copido, he goes on for a while. Sex mihi surga topus numeris in quinque residat. Ferrea cum vestris bella valete modis. Here's what he says. 
I was prepared to give forth arms and violent wars in heavy verse, heavy or serious verse, with the subject appropriate to the meter. He's talking about what we just mentioned, the fact that dactylic, uh, sorry, that dactylic hexameter is associated with epic verse. So in the first line, we have dun da dun da dun da dun da dun da Arma gravi numero violenta que bella paraba. But then something happens. The second verse was equal, but Cupid is said to have laughed and snatched away one of my feet. And here feet is being used in the metrical sense. So we go from hexameter down to pentameter in the second, in the second verse. So we've gone from epic poetry to elegiac couplets. And then Later, he says, let my work rise in six feet and fall back in five. Farewell to iron wars and your meters. So he's going to be writing love poetry, not epic poetry. And love poetry is less prestigious in the sort of Roman hierarchy of stuff they like to write poems about. Um, so these are the kind of amazing things that that poets can get up to. They can start to reflect on what exactly uh, on, on on their form, but we can't understand this unless we understand their form. And we can't understand their form very well with un understanding a lot of the language. And so these kinds of things are locked away unless you either know the language or go to all the uh, trouble of, you know, explaining it all like this. Um, but even so, there's still something missing because what are all the things that we didn't talk about? Um, so this is the kind of stuff that opens up when you learn a language with this kind of literature. Um, you get to experience those, the wordplay, you get to experience the, um, the, the sort of the sound effects of poetry, which are so hard to translate. Um, and that's all, oops, that's all waiting for you with Ovid. Bella is war. Yes. Um, Bella. It's a bit strange when people learn, bellum actually is war, um, singular, bella, plural. And it's a bit strange because it sounds like it means beautiful. Um, but it is, this. if you think of uh, the word bellicose, it's related to that. And so someone who likes war is bellicose. Or belligerent, someone who likes waging war. Belligerent. Oops. Great. I, I, I know I'm just going to start saying things in Latin at some point. <laughs> I'm too close to it. So if I say optime at some point, you'll know why. That, by the way, means excellent or great. All right. So Latin. Latin is Latin. Let's talk about Old English. Old English verse is quite... Old English verse is alliterative alliterative verse. So here's a line from Beowulf from very, very, very start in the prologue. And I'll use this to illustrate what I mean by alliterative verse. So it goes like this. And it means he grew under the heavens, prospered with honors. But I'll draw your attention to certain consonants here. Welks under Wolknum, Werthumindum, Thach. So three times in this line, we have words starting with W. And they're also placed in very particular spots. They're placed where the stress is. Welks under Wolknum, Werthumindum, Thach. And this is actually a rule for Old English verse. You need to have matching initial consonants in your stressed syllables. And that's what makes it alliterative verse, alliteration, repetition of initial sounds. Interestingly, the fourth one, you're actually not allowed to alliterate. Um, and so this gives Old English a very different, a very different feel in his poetry to a language like Latin or to modern English for that instance, because what we tend did to care about in modern English poetry is rhyme. Um, old English poetry does not care about rhyme 
virtually at all, except occasionally for, you know, to show off, you can add a little rhyme for effect, but it's not a formal part of the poetry like it is in modern English poetry. And so instead we have this alliterative verse. And what's interesting is to kind of compare the two because what is rhyme? But um, roses are, you know, roses are red, violets are blue. If I could spell blue, that would be lovely. Blue. And then, I don't know, whatever you want to finish it off with, but it has to end with something like you. Um, roses are red, violets are blue. I don't know. Mahmoud, do you know a good one of these? None of them uh, None of them is appropriate, appropriate for... for... <laughs> yeah. Um, roses are red, violets are blue. I live under a bridge and so do you. There you go. So blue and you, what's being for repeated them. here? <laughs> this, this sound, um, which I'll write in the phonetic alphabet as as this letter U, but it's the sound OO. So we have a repetition of like things, but what like things? We don't care about the bl, we don't care about the y, we only care about the vowel. So, and more specifically, we only care about the last part of the syllable. Now let's go back to Beowulf. What part of the syllable do we care about here? Just the first part. So we have kind of an inverse situation. In rhyming verse, you care about the end of the syllable, and in alliterative verse, you care about the start of the syllable. But what's crucial is in both cases, there is repetition of like things. Um, and so this is the kind of structure that ties the poem together, that keeps it from sort of disintegrating. Um, another thing that ties it together is meter. Um, Old English meter is not as strict as, um, as Latin meter. Oh, James, I like that one. <laughs> Um, but what old English, how old English meter works is you basically get a line like this, and you're allowed to have two halves of the line. And in each half, you're allowed to have one stressed word. So each of these stressed words is called a lift in, um, study of old English verse. doesn't really matter. The point is you get four of these accents. And two in the first half, two in the second half. You can have any number of unstressed syllables between them. So here we have none after it, thach, and nothing. Here we have werth mindum, two after it. Here we have wolknum, one after it. So you get different uh, different numbers of unstressed syllables in between these stresses. But the pulse is on the stresses. So werks und der wolknum, werth mindum, thach. And this gives Old English poetry its characteristic sound. Right. So now that we have the basics, let's look at some of the implications of that. What can we do with it? So we get these things called kennings, and these are amazing. This is something that is characteristic of Old English and other ancient Germanic poetry. Kennings are essentially circumlocutions, ways of referring to something in a roundabout way. So, for example, instead of saying the sea, you might say the sail road or the whale road. Instead of saying the sun, you might say the day's eye. And you can use you can do this in in modern English too. Um, instead of saying a person, you might say a voice bearer. Instead of saying the body, you might say a bone house. Right, so these are interesting ways of referring to everyday things. We do this in modern English too occasionally. If you've ever heard um, a raccoon referred to as a trash panda, uh, this is a kenning as well. Um, but they are, while they are perhaps rare in modern English, they are extremely common in Old English poetry. And they're, um, and we might stop to think why. And then when we think back about we think back to the um, the structure of Old English poetry and its alliterative nature, then we might start to realize that these so these serve a valuable function. So say you are alliterating and your consonant in your line is H and you really want to talk about the C. How are you going to do that? 
Well, if you have Ronrod Railroad, you've got a perfectly easy way to talk about the C in your line that's alliterating on H. And you're also showing off how creative you are as a poet, which is part of the fun, right? Um, so kennings are uh, are a huge part of, of Old English poetry, and it's kind of fun to go try and figure out what they mean. All right. So kennings are one thing, but... Oh, and incidentally, I'll just pronounce these because these are kind of fun. And this one that's so Sailrod, Hronrod, Dias Aye, Reorberend, and the Bonhus. And Dias Aye actually gives us the modern English word daisy, which I don't know, kind of like a sun. Excellent. All right, so now I have Milton. This is not Old English. This is actually modern English. Um, um, yeah, some people don't believe it, but technically it is modern English. And why do I bring this up? Because Milton, who is basically a, um, I don't know, he's basically obsessed with with the classical period he he his latin is some of the best that you'll find um in the roughly modern period milton's latin is excellent and when he wrote poetry he's very much writing influenced by these latin poets and one thing that latin loves is something called the periodic sentence periodic sentence modern Yes. Well, it depends on the language, but yeah, modern in terms of English linguistics is like modern philosophy. If you did your philosophy after the great vowel shift, that's modern. Um, that's an inside joke. Don't laugh. Okay. Paradise lost. So periodic sentences, what's going on there? Periodic sentence is a sentence that you don't really understand the point of until you've reached the last. Thank you, James. Thank you until you've reached the end of the sentence. And this is considered a, a stylistic virtue for the Romans. And Milton is adopting it here. So this is a, a, per, a perpetual struggle for Latin students reading a sentence. Wait, I, you have to keep everything in mind, every single word, every single phrase. How does it relate? You don't know until you get to the end. So I'll give you an example of what that feels like in English here. So the very first lines of Paradise Lost. Of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe with loss of Eden till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat, sing heavenly muse. So why are we uh, of man's first disobedience? What of? How do you start a sentence with an of? And this, all of this is what we want the heavenly muse to sing about. But we just mention it without saying why we're mentioning it up until line one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have six lines of poetry without the main verb of the sentence. And this is not unusual for uh, for Latin poetry. And Mil that's the style that Milton's trying to uh, trying to ape here. So this is a, you might call a periodic sentence, it's one where you don't understand the point until the very end. And this is possible in, well, it's technically possible in English, as you can see here, although we don't tend to do it a lot. What's interesting is you do see it also in Old English poetry a little bit. So here is a bit from farther on in Beowulf. Uh, I will read this out and then I'll explain what's going on. But as I read, think about the formal properties of Old English first. Think about the alliteration. Note what's what constant is being alliterated on in each of these lines. Okay. Dreori on the drevid, denum allum was, winum schildinga, varce on mode, toya tholianne, tene monium, on kuth erla jehuam, sithan asheres, on tham holm clipe havelan. Okay, so why do I bring this up in this context? If this is a relatively um, 
relatively word for word translation, or at least a phrase for phrase translation. For all of the Danes was, for the friends of the shieldings, suffering in the heart to endure for many thanes. It awakened grief in each of the nobles after the Asheres on the sea cliff had discovered or encountered. So why is this periodic? Well, it's not that periodic compared to Milton, but we talk about Ashere here. They're going off looking for Ashere in the context. Ashere is a, a counselor in the hall of Hrothgar in Herod, and they go off looking for him. He's been snatched away. They're going off on a search party looking for him, and they're upset, obviously, as you might be. Your counselor's missing, right? And then they find Asherah's, what do they find? Asherah's glove, Asherah's boot, Asherah's lunch, Asherah's cousin. What do they find? On the sea cliff, they find his head. Oh, at the end of Asherah. Um, so you get a little bit of that flavor of the periodic uh, sentence in Beowulf as well. And it's very hard, as you can see, because this is not the most free-flowing translation. Um, it's very hard to translate this suspense that you get by separating Ashere and his head. I'm not going to make a joke there. That's in poor taste. So these are kinds of things that happen. I know I already did, but I don't want to make a, I don't want to add insult to injury. Okay, so old English uh, in a rather hyper fashion. Hopefully, I have unveiled to you some of its some of its pleasures. Um, then the next language that I'm about to uh, talk about, I am by no means an expert on. I am a humble student, um, but I want to share some of the things that I have uh, that I have found. So classical Chinese, I'll just talk a little bit about what it is um, first, and then we can talk about some of the, the fun that's going on there. So classical Chinese is the name given to the literary language of China from the spring and autumn period up until the end of the Han dynasty. So we're talking about roughly from the eighth century BC to the early third century AD. Um, it's, you could, if you are thinking about it in terms of spoken language, it's like a written form of old Chinese, uh, which by the way, sounded very different. If you ever want to have fun, go look up reconstructions of old Chinese on, on YouTube. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a surprise. Um, this language, as it was more or less codified during that period, not formally codified, but it, um, there were certain texts that became canonical and everyone kept referring to them and using their style as something to imitate. And so beyond that period, even though people's spoken language changed, they still wrote like they used to. And this is what we call literary Chinese. But you can consider classical and literary Chinese to be um, quite similar. Um, and it was used up until, uh, well, it is actually still used, um, classical Chinese. You can There's a programming language where you can actually program in classical Chinese. Uh, but it was even used in the mainstream up until the 20th century, early 20th century. Uh, it is very different as a language for the languages we've discussed so far. One thing that you'll immediately note, um, if you've studied many European languages, especially ancient European languages, you will know that words like to inflect. People love to put endings on things, and they love to make you memorize gigantic tables of endings um, and passives and pluperfects and future perfects and imperfects and all of these um, varieties of perfection. And you don't you don't have to worry about that with uh, classical Chinese, it is a language where uh, where words do not change to, they don't have endings added onto them to express grammatical meaning. The grammatical meaning is expressed primarily through word order. And what is one thing that we saw that Latin really loves to play with, for example, word order. So right away, we can tell that the poet, the poetry of um, classical Chinese and Latin are going to be quite different because the languages that they are working with are so different. And the freedom and the flexibility of word order that Latin has because, um, because it's Latin does not exist to the same degree here. Okay, with that, 
um, this poem, Spring Scene, which was written uh, in a very chaotic time in Chinese history. Uh, well, I will uh, recite the translation here um, because I don't trust my pronunciation of classical Chinese, but in English, the country is broken, but mountains and rivers remain. The city enters spring, grass and trees have grown thick. Feeling the time, flowers shed tears. Hating separation, a bird startles the heart. Beacon, beacon fires span over three months. A family letter equals 10,000 tales of gold. My white hairs, as I scratch them, grow more sparse, simply becoming unable to hold hairpins, okay, in one translation. So what's interesting about, um, about this poem is, or about this style of poem, is becomes more obvious if we take it sort of character by character. So you can see just how different um, the language is. So you have roughly country broken, mountain river remain, city spring, grass, wood, um, thick, deep. Feel time, flower shed tear. Hate separation, bird startle heart. So as you can see, the translation we just had has supplied a lot. The country is broken, but mountains and rivers remain. We have plurals on here. The city enters spring in the present tense. Where was the present in the in the original text? Nowhere to be found. Grass and trees have grown thick. Where's the and come from? Feeling the time flowers shed tears. I don't see any ing. So look at all the um, interpolations that have to be made. And are those interpolations the right ones? Well, not necessarily. Maybe there's an ambiguity that we want to preserve, but we can't because English is the kind of language that it is. So you really have to encounter this on its own terms. Um, and there are some more, let's see, do I have more? Oh yeah. So I'll draw attention to one little formal device, which is the parallel couplet. So we saw the elegiac couplets that had this sort of setup and punchline style structure with the hexameter and the pentameter. We have couplets in this style of poetry as well, which is called regulated verse. And the way that it works, these middle couplets in here are what are called parallel couplets. And let me, here we go. So let's look at these two. Feel time, flower shed tear. Hate separation, bird startle heart. So in parallel couplets, you have to have the same semantic categories, the same type of word in the same position. So you have a, a verb of feeling here, and then you have a different verb of feeling here. You have a noun referring to the natural world here, another one. You have some sort of bodily action and another one. You have uh, something to do with the body here, tear, uh, tear heart. So you have this this parallelism. And here again, um, we have, say, a number, three, 10,000, and then a unit of measurement that is being paralleled. So although it may look like there's immense freedom here, this is an extremely constrained style of poetry. And, and how on earth are you going to translate that? How on earth are you going to be able to appreciate that, appreciate that in anything but the original language? Um, it's a challenge. Uh, and of course, we can talk at great length about all of these things, but without understanding much about the language itself, these pleasures are lost to you. And you may read a translation like this and say, eh, Shakespeare, it ain't. But you're missing a lot of the point of of what makes this kind of poem great because you, you're you stuck behind this wall of translation. And, and there's even more to say that the tones have to be arranged in a particular way that's extremely intricate. We won't go into it, um, but it's uh, it's quite interesting. What's also interesting about this style of poem is that it has a, a sort of a four stage progression. So it's divided into four couplets and each of these couplets has a function. So in these poems, you get the first, um, 
beginning, you begin at the beginning in which you um, establish the time and place and what the poem is about. And here we have a contrast between nature and the human world. The country is broken, mountains and rivers remain. The city enters spring, grass and trees have grown thick. Then we get the elaboration. The elaboration, where we continue this focus by introducing the first set of parallel images. So feeling the time, flowers shed tears. So it's as if the political chaos and destruction has e echoes in nature as well. Hating separation of birds startles the heart. And so we'll hear more about separation soon. Uh, so you get the feeling that nature is kind of echoing the, the human world, but at the same time, standing in stark contrast because it's uh, flourishing and society is in chaos. Then you get the turn where you get a second set of parallel images that, that contrast. Um, beacon fires span over three months. Incidentally, cultural note here is that like in Lord of the Rings, um, beacon fires are used when there's an invasion or there's some trouble. You light the beacon fires to get a message across the country quickly. So if you have beacon fires spanning over three months, that's not a good thing. And it's, excuse me, it's possible that this three months is referring to the three months uh, of the first three months of the year in which the poem was written, in which there was a big rebellion, or it's referring back to ancient history during a three month period where the capital of the, the Qin empire was burning, which is roughly in the same place as the capital at the same, at the time this is being written, so there might be an echo there. And then finally, you get the conclusion, where you go away from these images into reality. So right here, oh, sorry, there's the there's the ending. Um, right here, we we go back to the poet, my white hairs, as I scratch them, grow more sparse, simply becoming unable to hold hairpins. So we come back to reality away from these images and link to the, the original theme. Um, so the country is broken and our poet himself is also um, feeling his age, probably pretty careworn as well. Um, although incidentally, my white hair is here. All we have is white head. So the my is also being added by the translator. Um, yeah, I think that's probably enough to say about um, about this stuff. Um, here are some recommended readings that talk a lot more along the lines that I've been talking about. These are works that specialize in teaching people who don't know the language um, about the poetry and about the kind of stuff that gets lost in translation. Um, so if anyone wants to screenshot that, I'll keep it up for, for a, a few minutes. And then I will probably, um, I don't know, I'll probably zip my mouth uh, and we can turn the rest of uh, the time into a, a discussion about if you want, if you're sold, if I've turned on a light bulb or something um, in you, how you actually might go about learning one of these languages. Um, because there are definitely things that work better and 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 worse. And unfortunately, most people if you go and you just buy a course or you buy a book, you're going to be going down the road of that works worse. Um, um, so pre I have done some Sanskrit and I really want to get back to it. I, I can see my old textbook from here uh, across the room. It's uh, yeah, it's definitely on my bucket list. I'm, I'm trying to tackle Greek first. Figure Latin. Old English, Greek, Sanskrit, and then I'll be happy. Unlikely. Yeah, so many languages, so little time. Okay, and I will also have a a sleazy self-promotion slide here, just in case you want to hear more about this nonsense. Um, 
and then why don't we give it its five seconds or so, and then we can uh, we can talk about how to learn these languages. Okay, I will stop the share. Great, here we are again. So if you want to learn one of these languages, what would you do? I'm curious. Do we want to, Mahmoud, can we open it up? Can people unmute themselves? And just yeah, ask yeah, sure. Just feel free to unmute and jump in. Thank you very much. This this was really interesting. And my yeah, pleasure. I'm I'm actually curious about how. I'll I'll tell you about myself, for example. Not dead languages, Spanish. When I came to Spain to learn Spanish, I learned Spanish reading sports newspapers. So this is pretty much it for me. No poems, no literature, nothing of the sort. Just your regular, you know, sports newspapers and, and that's it. Is there the equivalent of sports newspaper for dead languages? That would actually be... Not really... <laughs> <laughs> Not really. So this is part of the challenge because we might have, you know, you may have comics, you may have, you know, for, for, I know a lot of people who learn Japanese use anime. Um, there are these things that are, that we are already in the habit of reading or watching or listening to that we can use to, to remarkably accelerate our progress, which generally we don't have with ancient languages. Uh, generally the things that survive are usually, you know, either extremely um, high literature, <laughs> poetry, religious texts, um, or there are things like um, receipts for copper merchants or, you know, wills, things like that. So the challenge is to find material that, that works, uh, that works for you as a learner, not only due to its own properties of being, you know, simple enough to understand, but also being intrinsically interesting enough for you to want to spend the time doing it. Those are the two hoops it has to jump through. And there are some solutions for this. Um, for languages that are more commonly studied, uh, there are texts that are um, that are written for learners that are meant that ideally, if they've achieved their goals, they are comprehensible in the language that they use. So if you've learned you know, X number of vocabulary, you can come to this text and read it relatively easily and it'll sort of gradually drip new words and new grammatical things into your knowledge and you'll just sort of passively pick them up like you did uh, Mahmoud with, um, with the sports pages. Um, but this is not- Because you understand the context already in a different, right? Like you know everything exactly. about, about football, you know everything about the teams, you know everything about like the context is there. Like I'm, I'm serious. I, I genuinely, all I did was watch a football uh, program, like commentary program, and then read the newspapers. So I'm, I'm curious about how you would do that with not necessarily, of course, sports, but, but yeah, like how would you immerse? Like what's your method? How would you, how, where would you start from? Because it, it can get quite tedious for people who are learning it through your tr traditional methods and then, you know, with grammar and, and conjugation and, and stuff like that. And it can get quite tedious. So what I do is I just get obsessed with one text, one poem or one, one text of some sort. For, so for me, for Old English, it was Beowulf. And I got obsessed with it to a degree that I just put up with the fact that I didn't understand that much the first time I read it. And I'd be, you know, I'd have my dictionary open and, you know, some things I would just say, oh, you know, this is too much. I'm not going to worry about it. Just, I won't understand this 10 line section. I'll move on to something else. And I'll look this up. Oh, okay. That makes sense. And then I would just do it again and again and again. And, you know, over the years, it got easier every time. And then suddenly I started getting this weird thing where I would just know the word it would just pop into my head and I don't know where I learned it I must have read it somewhere um inevitably I did but I don't remember doing it and it happened because 
that somewhat obsessive interest allowed me to focus on doing this thing long enough so that my mind was doing the work for me subconsciously um, of, of building up this representation of the language kind of without my, without too much help from me. All I did was made sure my eyes were on the text and understanding as much as possible for as long as possible. I'm seeing some some good questions from the chat here. Um, Tennyson's asking, how much easier was Old English compared to Latin? Um, Old English is definitely easier than Latin. It's, uh, you get just, so Latin has a lot of cognates, um, not really, well, we'll say cognates, yeah. I know I have some linguists here, so you can quibble with that use of cognates, but um, uh, words that are uh, closely, they look a lot like their English equivalents, so that, that can help you. Um, old English has more. So this just makes everything easier. Whereas from an English speaking perspective, classical Chinese has none. <laughs> so that makes things that much harder. Um, and you just essentially, it's like a multiplier on the difficulty. So with Old English, you're just going to take, you know, I don't know how much less time, but say some fraction of the time that you would take to get to that level in Latin. And then with Akkadian, you would have you know, that much hard of a time or classical Chinese, you'd have that much hard of a time. Uh, before uh, Elias's question, is it the uh, Supreth? You, you had something to say, feel free to jump in. Yeah, hello, am I audible? Yes, yes. loud and clear. I'm also drunk now, so I'm not gonna put my video on, sorry about that. I'm drunk and I'm talking. Don't ask. Uh, what I was going to say is that for Sanskrit, uh, you have it's not really a dead language compared to Latin or to ancient Greek. Hmm? We have a village in India called Mathuru. Hmm? Uh, it's, uh, it's near it's near Mathur, Mandya, in South India, and. Uh, the the entire line, the entire village of around fifteen thousand people or eighteen thousand I can't remember the number sorry check it up Google Google it up can speak Sanskrit as a first language. That's fantastic. Mm. Uh, like Sanskrit of our version of Sanskrit, not the version of uh, like Panini and uh, Ganahasta and Ade, uh, but not that advanced version the colloquial sanskrit which is 99 percent sanskrit hopefully and they uh, regularly allow allow people this is like a completely close community but they every year they bring people over like as exchange ex students and such and they and they allow them to stay in their village everything from shopping or uh, asking anything in, in the panchayats or uh, doing anything is done by the system is done in sanskrit and it will uh, in 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 their opinion will help them learn the language quickly well if you and have that access then that's the way to do it I mean, <laughs> that's for, fantastic for me i did have that access as i said i'm, I'm studying ancient greek now so i can't really access that system now but back home, I did have the access, and that was how I learned Kannada and uh, some Tamil and Telugu, and also Urdu, uh, also along with Hindi and English, just by communicating in what I want in English or in Tamil or in Telugu or in Urdu. Mm. And uh, just for context, everything, these all I mean, is from South India, and uh, these are the at least in my opinion, one of the best ways to learn a language. It's uh, just directly, it's, it's just like learning a modern, modern Greek or Italian or Spanish. Or, you can actually go to a country page for it and learn. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is picking up something that I was um, planning on saying, actually. The more you can make your experience of one of these ancient languages like a living language, um, the better and more quickly you will learn. Uh, this and is 
and one more thing is that at least for the indian versions at least the northern indian sanskrit uh, and also kannada are uh, mostly most of our languages are so closely tied together with sanskrit pali they're so tied together with the local native languages of our own states to do and other native languages of our own states that we don't have to really shift a lot of like like thinking in a different variety altogether mm-hmm. to learn language i don't here i have to i use my knowledge of uh, sanskrit in a way to learn greek mm-hmm. my language was not just uh, kannada to learn greek but this on this idea won't really work if i want to learn portuguese Mm. with portuguese you have the great benefit of being able to go to portugal or brazil or somewhere else and 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 make friends to, yeah i can't go to goa but yeah yeah okay right um uh, oh good so i'm going to before before that because uh, as a follow up to what you were just uh, talking about how do you not forget or lose this is a question from uh, elias uh, or lose a dead language literally a language nobody uses around you so no natural trigger or reminder so there are two things two strategies that i use one um i make it my business to keep keep that language in my life by teaching um this is not something that everyone can can or would want to do um but it works for me um the another thing you can do is you can just essentially make friends with a bunch of people who lived 2000 years ago and and establish a reading habit um presumably if you want to learn one of these languages you're going to be interested enough in the culture of of that time and place that there's probably more than one or two texts that you'd be interested in in reading and so that you can you know for a language like latin or ancient greek or or sanskrit for that matter or even old english um there's a huge amount of texts that you can read you're not ever going to be bored um at least you're not ever going to lack for something to read next so uh, if you can work it out with your life and this is not obviously the easiest thing but if you can work it out with your life to to have reading these texts be part of something that you do every day or every week then it's um it, that's really beneficial the other thing that i can say is when you're learning languages that are related to modern languages it's a lot easier to keep to keep that ancient language in mind. So for example, if you are learning Portuguese and you've learned Latin, you know, 90% of what you say in Portuguese has a very clear analog to uh to Latin and every time you say you know, bon, you're going to remember you're going to be slightly triggering your recollection of bonus and that can only help. Um so that I also find helpful. I like to learn families of languages for that reason. It does get confusing. to be honest at some time but um once you pass that first stage where it's confusing it actually becomes very helpful and uh, so just to, just to jump in you can also use social media memes to be honest uh, a lot of memes uh, your instagram reels instagram youtube shorts are the best help in this matter at least show the modern languages show some of most of instagram shorts these days are in english you can search for sanskrit i don't know sanskrit to kannada or tamil classical tamil and modern tamil and in most of the cases the modern language and its ancient equivalent at least is so closely tied together due to its, its location its culture its influences due to others or being influenced it's always closely tied together so you will learn a new language by just constantly exposing yourself to new memes to the sports of the country like in india we play cricket we love cricket uh very nice if you can just follow the cricket news and updates of every single person who comments on the sport in youtube in facebook in instagram you yourself have got like a good starting point just like the japanese have the anime and the mangas we have cricket use our local uh, cultures and use our local attractions and hopefully it will help you out it sure is not a helpful for the ancient greek as uh, just asked previously but it is still useful to talk 
Mm -hmm. in this and there are definitely there are definitely memes available in in ancient Greek and 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 Latin and maybe not old English yet or maybe maybe we'll get some. But uh, I want to make sure that we get uh, to Barry's question about um, Old English and Celtic. Um, so working with Old English, it's very interesting. Old English is surprisingly uninfluenced by Celtic, um, given the circumstances under which it it developed. Um, that said, I actually was interested in uh, Celtic. I, I studied Celtic linguistics a, a long time before I studied Old English formally. So um, just by sheer coincidence, I happen to be interested in both. But uh, but it's it's it might be strange given the historical context that they don't have as much to do with each other. And um, Eng Seng, if I'm if that's an abbreviation, I'm not sure. Um, it's very small on my screen. Uh, have asks Have I ever tried to make virtual discussions to each? Oh, I see you now. Um, to ease the way to learn an ancient language and immerse yourself in it. Yes, yes. So this is this is kind of my day job. Um, I teach with the Ancient Language Institute, uh, and the methodology that we use there is basically this. So as much as possible of the class is taught in the language. Um, so Latin, uh, ancient Greek, biblical Hebrew, um, old English. Now, um, we we use this um, we use this living language approach as much as possible. Now, in the introductory classes, it's less possible because there is just not as much of a vocabulary base among the class. So you have to pop out into English uh, and explain things from time to time. But as much as possible, we talk about a text together and we just talk in the language as much as possible. Um, ah, quis intravit per portam? Ah, est filius, est filius Julia, you know, this kind of thing. So who's coming in through the door? Oh, it's or for, through the gate. It's Julia's um, son. Uh, this is the kind of, you know, we'll ask and answer each other these kinds of questions. It's very, your experience with your uh, Greek professor is very common because for a long time, um, this was considered just sort of not done. And most of a generation, most of the generations who learned in the 20th century didn't do it this way. And they're just completely un, either unwilling or unable or uninterested. Uh, and I don't want to paint everyone with the same brush, but it's, it's a common experience. Um, interestingly, before the 18th century, the way that I describe was common. So in the Renaissance, you had people speaking, um, having dialogues in Latin uh, students back and forth. But um, with the Victorians, they sort of stopped doing that. And they they came to a, an understanding of learning Latin in particular, where sitting down and doing it because it's hard was morally valuable and it built character, which, you know, maybe it does. I don't know. But I'd also rather just learn the language than build character. <laughs> Thank you for your reply. Yeah, <laughs> my pleasure. Hope that uh, I hope that that sort of gives a perspective on it. And Walter's question, I guess I sort of answered that as well. That that is my approach for teaching Latin and ancient Greek. And let's see the link for the school. Uh, yeah, it's, I'll put it in the chat. They have a good, they have a good URL. They, they got a good domain. Look at that. We have a domainer now as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but this is my, my question would be, or uh, yeah, first, uh, Emma, uh, do you have any books you would recommend? That discuss the history of how that languages have been taught going off uh, of what you mentioned about Victorian methods? Not books um, so much, but uh, the, the history of that that I've learned has been mainly through articles. Um, mm, I'm trying to think if there was a if there's a sort of a, a classic source for books. There's a there's a book on um, W. H. Rouse. And his work in the early 20th century, introducing the direct method that does talk about a lot of this, this sort of stuff. 
how it kind of, as you said, in the 19th century, it fell out of favour and the grammar translation technique was developed. But then at the start of the 20th century, we got the direct method. And then it kind of revert, we reverted back um, yeah. for a little while. Um, but yeah, there's a bit of a history of, of the... Uh, it, also, there's a, um, a book on the history of the classical association in the UK in the 20th century, which covers a lot of this stuff because that went through that same cycle of classics teaching in the UK. Yeah, James is very, very much, um, uh, very much a connoisseur of of these kinds of approaches as well. Thank you for joining uh, us, James. So my my question was how how do you start? Do you start by learning basics? Do you start by just accumulating vocabulary? Do you learn grammar, syntax, and stuff like that? What What's your entry point? Uh, my entry point is um, usually if I can find a frequency list, a vocabulary frequency list, I will, I'll bite the bullet and start the, I'll just learn like the most frequent 200 or 300 words. Um, this provides you with a basis so that you're not, you're not literally going to the dictionary for every word. So I'll give you the, what I do if I didn't have a teacher. Um, I would yeah find a, a frequency list, uh, put together some flashcards, brute force it. It's not going to be fun, probably, unless you find that kind of thing fun, um, with a text in mind. Then I would, after I've learned those things, I would go to the text and see what the experience is like. Um, if my comprehension is getting pretty good, then I'll just keep reading. If my comprehension is not yet good enough, I will go farther down on the frequency list until I reach a point where I'm not in pain while reading this, this text. But it would all be oriented around that particular text that I become obsessed with. That is the reason that I wanted to learn that language. Um, now, that's the hard way. The easy way is to find a teacher who is hip to these methods and just go with them because they've sorted this all up for you. <laughs> um, for example, the, you know, Technically, this is self-promotion, but it gives you some context. Um, for Old English, I've written a book uh, that that uses these methods of giving people an engaging story that you that gradually unfolds vocabulary and grammar in context um, that I use in my Old English teaching. Uh, there's a very famous one that is used for Latin called Familia Romana, uh, which is collections of stories about a Roman family and um, it builds you up from nothing essentially to uh, a pretty solid intermediate level of of Latin uh, reading ability, and just by telling you these little illustrated stories about bratty kids and people stealing things and going off and having boat trips and things like that, uh, it's a, it's a fun book, um, and uh, and so that's I use that for for Latin teaching. And there's one for Greek as well, and I've seen that they've been you know people are starting to develop versions for other languages but it it's kind of slow as you can imagine the market for you know like teach yourself akkadian is not the most gigantic yeah, athenadze is the one for greek although i know for <laughs> i've heard that people have been working on replacements for athenadze to make it a little bit more true to the method uh, for a while now. Uh, this is a question on behalf of Elias. I don't know if he might have even thought about it, but have you dabbled in Syriac? I have not. I have not. Um, I am... <sighs> yeah. Look at him. Look at him. Yeah. <laughs> I... Yeah, I really would love. I really would love that. I'm tr I'm looking, you know, at the the human lifespan and how many languages I want to learn, and I'm having some some very dark conclusions. Um, James, yes, thank you. That was that that was a setup, incidentally. Uh, so James got some stuff for for Greek in the chat. Yeah, Syriac would be nice. I would love to get into the Semitic family. Um, you know, that would be a lot of fun. Um, Probably. Also, you have not dabbled in any of the languages. No, I have not learned any Semitic languages uh, yet. The the closest I can I, I've come is through 
the portion of Yiddish that comes from from Hebrew. Um, so I have a few vote. I have a few words, but I don't. You know, the grammar. I've got nothing. Oh, and have you seen the uh, Harry Potter texts that are in Latin? I have, I have. Um, Harry Potter, Winnie the Pooh, Cat in the Hat. There are, there are some, there are some Latin translations of of some of the most popular, um, mainly kids' books, but they're amazing. Yeah, I think I have the Winnie the Pooh. Is it? No. It's somewhere. It's somewhere around here. I have an old battered copy. Do you know that was a, a New York Times bestseller? Winnie il le no. Only only Latin language bestseller. <laughs> interesting. Uh, now now that's yeah one interesting kind of trivia you can share at a cocktail party. Other than yeah, if that, not, I don't if think nothing the others were. else. <laughs> well, no, the, did I mean, you depends. know that Winnie? <laughs> I'm reminded of the um of uh in Indiana Jones um when Marcus Brody if anyone's seen it they're saying you know Marcus Brody he's you know he can fit in anywhere he speaks 12 languages you know he'll be gone and then you, the next thing you see is Marcus Brody in some some town saying does anyone speak English or ancient Greek <laughs> yep. if you're um... the right crowd it works uh da preciado is asking so uh next week i will be starting uh teaching latin to a group of portuguese speaker speakers some of them don't even speak their language correctly <laughs> any recommendations yeah well um i see logan's <laughs> given a good uh response to that already but i will say in terms of um in terms of latin for portuguese speakers specifically well, there's a big leg up compared to English, isn't there, um, due to the relatedness. And that can be some something of a double-edged sword. Um, but it's uh, the the distance between Portuguese and Latin and the distance between English and Latin, you know, Portuguese is it's a much smaller distance. So I think you'll probably, if it's the first time that you've, you've taught Latin to Portuguese speakers, I think you'll probably find it to be a... Um, a pretty good experience. Uh, you can point out a lot of, um, you know, this word comes from this, this word comes from this, that, this is this word that you know, but you know, the vowel is a little bit different. And I always, I'm always sure to introduce these sort of trivial facts in my teaching, A, because I love trivia, as you all by now know, but B, because every little extra fact that you tell someone about something they're learning that connects with something they already know is something that means that they're that much less likely to forget it. It's like you're you're adding a bit to their existing knowledge of the world. You're not giving them something utterly, totally new. And that um, that really helps. And this is also why learning related languages works well because you can, for every word you learn, it's like, oh, yes, it's just like this in this other language I know, but with this change. And far from overburdening the memory, that actually helps. So um, I, other than that, I would say, you know, depending on your your methods and the textbook you're using, um, my advice would be totally different. But yeah, I would say, yeah, it should be good. Have you ever considered uh, trying uh, songs in old languages because they stick more to their brain, but then good luck for the ones who wants to hear them, but yeah. Yeah, well, there are, <laughs> this has become um, this has become a kind of a, a trend on YouTube where people will do, I think the, the bardcore, so they'll do translations of pop songs into ancient or historical languages. So yeah, search bardcore. I'll just write it in the chat. Um, you can see they have ones in Old English and Latin. I saw House of the Rising Sun in Old French on there at one point, um, and they, uh, you know, I don't know if they're all as accurate as the ones that so I writing this down. Uh, but yeah they usually get someone who's an expert in the pronunciation to advise the singer um yeah you cannot you can't <laughs> escape the nerds you can't we are surrounded my god the bridge is surrounded yeah maybe yeah well deep down I'm an aspiring nerd perhaps Abba had a good base in Bartcore ancient Greek whoa 
Uh, yeah. So uh, first off, this was this was really really nice. Thank you very much for doing this, Colin. Uh, I hope uh, everyone who joined has found some sort of joy, even remotely at least, in uh, dead or learning dead languages. Uh, this was really good. But uh, yeah, I don't know if anyone has one last question uh, before we call it a day. And if not, if Colin has any last words to share. Colin? Yeah, if no one has anything else, I would just say, um, I would encourage you, if, if any of you have um, any desire to learn any of these languages or, or other historical languages, um, to go for it. If you want any advice, um, you can always DM me on Twitter. Uh, my, I'll put my thing in my link in the chat. And I'm always happy to, that's right. Um, I'm always happy to, to, to set people on the right path with, with these things. Thank you very much everyone for joining and, uh, you know, where to find Colin. Thanks again, Colin, for doing this. This was really good and yeah. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining and hope to see you around. Have a good day. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Cheers, man. Cheers.